Well, good morning. morning. That's pretty good. We're awake this morning. I'm Pastor Shane. I want to welcome you this morning to First Christian Church. We are excited that you're here with us. Uh, Great job to our praise team and Charlene doing announcements and to Ed doing that communion meditation. Great job. Um, If you cannot tell, we are in the Advent season here. And that is a big fancy word. That means we are purposely reflecting on the birth of Jesus this time of year. It's December 1st. Uh, Everyone's garland and lights are up. It's chaos. Our calendars are probably full. If you have kids, you have a million things you have to do. Family coming in. We just wrapped up Thanksgiving. Um, But we want to be intentional in our time this year to reflect on the birth of Jesus, what that means, and that this time of year we choose to celebrate that our Savior was born to us and that God sent his Son to earth. And so uh, over the next uh, three or four Sundays, as we build up towards the Christmas, uh, December 25th, each Sunday we want to look at people or passages from the Bible and see the joy that they have. And so today we're going to be looking at a guy named Mephibosheth. Now, the hardest part of my week has been typing Mephibosheth a thousand times in my sermon, and now it'll be me having to say Mephibosheth all these times. Okay, so just bear with me. Um, It's not the easiest name. There's a lot of F sounds. Okay, but we're going to get through it. And so if you want, you can turn to 2 Samuel chapter number 9. That's where we're going to rest a lot uh, today. Um, But if you're like me, maybe you have a lot of memories growing up as a kid uh, around the holiday season, Thanksgiving to Christmas, New Year's, that time of year. Maybe you gathered with family for meals or hung out or whatever it is. When I was a kid, um, my great-grandmother lived in Missouri in a little town called Beulah. It was the church and her house. That was the town, okay? Uh, And then the pastor of the church lived in like a single wide trailer that was probably the first trailer ever built uh, ever. Um, And so you had to take like back roads. If you've never been to Missouri, they don't have like state road 15. They have like road E and road like EE. Okay, so you're like four or five letters deep to get to where she's at. Um, And it's actually the area my grandmother grew up in, in the Ozark Mountains. And so we would visit my grandparents. They were living in St. Louis at the time. And we'd make this trek down to Grandma Barker's house, okay, uh, at Christmas time to have dinner at her house. Now, my Grandma Barker um, had a four burner stove like most of us, but she'd have about 15 pots cooking on that stove somehow. Um, It was all delicious. A lot of it was homegrown. Um, And she had just a little tiny old house. And we'd all crowd in there, a whole bunch of family. Um, And there were two tables at this house. In the kitchen slash dining area, there was the adult table. All right, this is where mom and dad, aunt and uncle, grandma and grandpa, they sat there. And it was even then a conglomeration of a bunch of different tables because it was just Grandma Barker most of the time. So she just had a tiny little table for herself, but she would stick all these tables together for the adult table. And then in the living room was the kid table. The kid table was an old card table, one of those folding card tables. Um, It was probably the first one from Sears ever. My great-grandma retired from Sears. She was a proud Sears and Roebuck employee. Uh, And it it had a lean to it. Okay, and it didn't help. The floor had a little bit of a lean to it. Um, The table had many stains because I think my parent, my mom sat at it as a kid table when she was a kid. All right, but it was, we were the kids. We were in the living room. Uh, She had no TV. That's tough when you're a kid, right? No TV, but it was the kid table. Man, I wanted so bad one day to sit at the adult table, right? It was literally like four feet from the kid table to the adult table. All right, but man, I wanted a spot at the adult table. It always seemed like they were having a lot of fun, okay? They they were having great conversation. Uh, My little brother wouldn't have been there if I was at the adult table. Uh, There were less drinks spilled at the adult table than there were at the kid table, okay? But man, I just wanted a seat at that table. And now as as an adult, uh, I never did get a seat. Grandma Barker passed away before I uh, ever got a seat at the adult table. And that's okay, because I have great memories of the kid table. Um, what great memories I have of just being together with family at that time, sharing a meal um, that was cooked with love. But man, maybe like you when you were a kid, you remember thinking, I, one day I want to be at the adult table. 
There's like a weird commercial on right now of a kid asking to be at the adult table. Um, I haven't quite figured it out. But we want a seat at the table, right? Because we think that it comes with that. I'm mature. I'm an adult now. I'm older. But today, as we look at Mephibosheth, we're going to see he gets a seat at a table and how much joy that brings to him. So we're going to read the whole chapter of 2 Samuel chapter 9. So follow along with me. It says, And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they had called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And then he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. His, he is crippled in his feet. And the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machar, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machar to the, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar, and Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell on his face, and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore you to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belonged to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him, and shall bring in the produce, that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. And then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servants, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. Let's pray. Dear and Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this chance to open your word, Lord, and to look at this story. God, I pray now as we uh, just reflect on the story of Mephibosheth, Lord, that our hearts and minds will be open to what you have to say. That it would not be my words that are heard today, Lord, but it would be yours and that you'd be glorified. Lord, I pray the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so when we pick up this story of Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel 9, uh, maybe we've never read it before. Or maybe it's just something you've never really given a second thought to. It's kind of just stuck in here in 2 Samuel as it's recording Israel's history. So Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan. He's the grandson of Saul, who is the first king of Israel. And for the backstory on this, we've got to be reminded of a few things here. Saul is the first king. Remember, Israel cries out, we want a king, we want a king. And God finally tells Samuel, there's going to be a king, go pick him out. Saul is like head and shoulders taller than the rest of Israel. He looks like a king. But Saul is, is kind of known for bad decisions. And so in a rash decision, he makes an offering that only Samuel was allowed to make. And his kingly reign will come to an end because of it. So instead of allowing Saul's children and family to be the kingly line in Israel, God will appoint another. And it reads like this in 1 Samuel 13. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So Saul is impatient. And because of this, he knows someone else will now be appointed to rule over Israel. And if you know anything about Bible history, this person that will be picked to rule over Israel is David. So Samuel is sent by God to the town of Bethlehem, maybe a town we've heard of before, to this man named Jesse. And it's told that one of the sons of Jesse will now be anointed to be the next king. And so 
Samuel talks with Jesse, and Jesse brings in his sons for Samuel to look at and to pray and see if God has picked, or which of these sons he's picked. And so he sends them in birth order, so the oldest first, and they're probably expecting the oldest will be picked, right? The oldest, this guy will be the next king. And God says no. In fact, he says no to seven of Jesse's sons. Right? And so you can imagine Samuel going, God, you sent me here. You said it would be one of Jesse's sons. He sent in what I assume is all of his sons. There's seven of them. You've told me no. And so finally Samuel says, is this it? Do you have any other sons? And Jesse goes, yeah, I got one more, but he's young, he's a kid, he's out tending to the sheep. And Samuel tells him, well, send him in, and this is the one that the Lord picks, the youngest son of Jesse. He is picked by God, he is then anointed by Samuel to be the next king. We, of course, know this as David. David is then used to defeat Goliath. He'll lead Israel in battle even before he's officially king. He'll do great things for God. The problem is Saul is still alive and is still king. And so if you imagine Saul already, we know, makes rash decisions, all right, is kind of a hothead. And now he's been told there will be a new king and the new king is going to be this teenage kid. All right, probably doesn't take that news well. Not only is he going to be a teenage kid, but God is going to use him. And eventually when he's an adult, he will be the new king. And so Saul will actually spend much of his last years of his life hunting down David in an attempt to kill him. During all this time, though, David becomes very close friends with one of Saul's sons, Jonathan. They become very close, essentially brothers. As much as two men who are, have different birth parents could be, they are as close as brothers. And this brotherhood between them means that Jonathan's looking out for David as Saul is looking to kill David. And so you have this interesting dynamic where literally, I don't know if you've ever had a friend whose like parents didn't like you. I don't know if you ever had that. I had a, a buddy at one time whose parents weren't a big fan of me. Okay, and this is like another level. It's more than like, we don't like your friend. It's Saul looking at Jonathan and saying, I would like to murder your friend. All right, your buddy David, I would prefer to pin him to the wall with a spear than you be friends. All right, so a little animosity, a little tension there. But uh, Jonathan is, is taking the time to protect and look out for his friend David. It's an amazing example of caring about another person, serving them and placing others before yourself. And so I don't know if you've ever had an earthly relationship like this, a friendship, more than just coworkers or neighbors or, or someone you went to school with, but a genuine love and care for a friend. I think it's very rare and it's something special and should be honored. And David and Jonathan clearly care about each other and wanted each other to succeed and be blessed by God. But there's a problem. And Jonathan, I believe, is fully aware of this problem. Uh, David will be the next king. God has chosen him. I don't think there's any instance where Jonathan is denying this. In fact, it would seem that Jonathan is fully aware David will be the king, and he's trusting God for this. And we even see it discussed between Jonathan and David in 1 Samuel 20, in verses 14 to 17. It says this, this is Jonathan speaking, If I'm still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love for my house forever, when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Jonathan knew what every son of a king knew at that time, that if a new king rose to power, the heirs to that throne, the families of that old king faced certain death. This new king would want to leave no loose ends. He didn't want anyone to try and stand up and rise up and say, no, I have the rightful claim to the throne. It is I who should be king and cause a problem. So they want no enemy from this old regime. Right? And Jonathan asked David, deal mercifully with me. He asked him not to cut off his love from his house. Jonathan knew that God would wipe the enemies of David off the earth. That God had picked David to be king. 
and that God was with David. Jonathan simply asked that David would love his family like his own. What a tough ask, right? What a tough reality to face for Jonathan. Hey, I, Jonathan, son of Saul, there may be a chance I could be king, but my father has ruined that. He has not trusted God like God asked him to. That has been taken from our family, and there's a new king that will be king, a new guy, and he's my best friend. And so Jonathan just simply asked David, protect and love my family when that change happens. And so as we move forward, Saul is eventually killed, Jonathan, his son as well. And as the regime of Saul is ending, the family of Saul flees to try and protect themselves. They know what's happening and what could happen, so they flee to security. And in 2 Samuel 4, 4, we read this. Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. So imagine this chaos. There's battle. Saul is killed. And so it's clear. Saul is dead. The new king will now take power. David will now be king. Jonathan is killed in this too. And there has to be chaos. Chaos in the kingdom for Saul's regime. They know a new king will be in power. They will lose power. Right? We see this every four years when presidents turn over. There's chaos. Right? If we go back when uh, George W. was elected, right? Clinton administration removed all the W's off the keyboard. Do you guys remember that? Right? There, there's still chaos today. Luckily, uh, we don't put to death the previous presidential regime. That would be crazy. Um, but there's chaos as Saul's leading comes to an end. And David will take power. And so in a hurry, this nurse picks up Mephibosheth and begins to flee, seeking safety and security. And at some point, Mephibosheth falls and becomes lame. He is crippled in his feet. And it says he was five years old, so he was young then. And so this time between what happens here in chapter 4 and when we get to chapter 9, Mephibosheth has grown. Right? But, but imagine now Mephibosheth crippled. Hiding from this new king out of fear. I doubt Jonathan had sat down with this five-year-old son and said, listen, here's what's going to happen. Your grandpa Saul, he's not going to be king anymore, but it's okay. David's my best friend, and he's going to watch over us. Even if that conversation had happened, I'm sure in the heat of that moment, that conversation was not thought of by Jonathan's uh, staff, his servants. And so they hide. And that brings us to 2 Samuel 9. It opens with David asking, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? So what do we see here? David remembers his promise. He remembers his promise he's made to Jonathan. And he's asking not just is there anyone of Jonathan's house, but is there anyone of Saul's house that I can honor this covenant I've made with Jonathan? anyone. Remember, Saul hunted David. In biblical records, we really don't see any other family member protecting David like Jonathan did. But David is seeking to honor his covenant with Jonathan, no matter the member of the family. And that's when he learns of Mephibosheth. He's crippled. He's being housed in Lodabar, probably hidden, about 70 or 80 miles north of Jerusalem where David would have been. They probably would have thought this is a safe place to hide. 70 to 80 miles today doesn't sound that hard for us, right? We can hop in a car, that's an hour, right? But at that time, that's a long journey. Walking or riding an animal 70 or 80 miles, that's a long journey. And so I'm sure they thought we're safe here. We'll keep it quiet, right? We're a long distance from David in Jerusalem. We're a long distance from a, a threat. But David calls for Mephibosheth and he is brought to him. Now imagine being Mephibosheth. You know, you could possibly be the only living relative to Saul, and that means you have a target on your back. Right? You're the last loose end of Saul's leadership. And there's a possibility that you need to be dealt with by this new king because he could be in fear that you may be causing an uprising. 
You're fearful to be found. You've been hiding since you were five. You're fearful that you may be found and possibly killed. And to compound all of this, you're crippled. You're crippled. You, you have no way of really defending yourself. You have no fighting chance against David. David killed a giant when he's a teenager. He's led God's armies in victories and in battles. He's a strong leader. He is a man after God's own heart. He's been picked and anointed by God to be the new king. And you are a young man who's been crippled since he was a child. What fight do you have against David? Then one day you get the worst news of all. David knows where you are and he needs you in Jerusalem. He wants you there. Now, do you think this messenger came and said, good news, David wants to honor you? David wants to lift you up? Or did he simply come and say, the king needs to see you? Talk about anxiety and fear. Do you remember that feeling of ever getting called to like the principal's office, if you were a bad kid, maybe? Or mom or dad saying, we're going to talk about this when we get home. That fear or worry or anxiety of getting in trouble. But this is, is just multiplied infinitely by the fact that the king is asking to see you. And so Mephibosheth makes his way to Jerusalem. Notice he could have run. He could have said, get me out of here, hide me, take me somewhere else. But he makes his way to Jerusalem. And when he gets in the presence of David, he does one thing. Falls on his face and pays homage to David. He wanted to make this positionally clear. Mephibosheth is no enemy to be feared. He's not leading an army into Jerusalem to take on David. He is nothing but a servant to the king. He's a servant to this king. He has no fighting chance against David. And how does David respond? He calls out his name, Mephibosheth. He says, here I am, I'm uh, your servant. I am your servant in verse six. Behold, I'm your servant. And David says to him, the three best words you can hear in this situation, do not fear. Right, three great words to hear in a stressful situation. Do not fear. Especially when your life is on the line, do not be afraid, Mephibosheth. David is saying, I'm not here to harm you. I've not called you to Jerusalem to put you to death but to show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. What a change of emotion Mephibosheth must have felt. From fear and anxiety to joy. Do not fear. I'm here to honor a promise to show you kindness. He was probably worried his life was over, that this would be the end, but that fear is gone. In fact, if the story just ended right there in, in verse 7, I would say it's still a beautiful story. Do not fear. I'm here to show you kindness. Next chapter. But it doesn't end there. David goes on. He says there's blessings for Mephibosheth. He won't have to worry about hiding anymore. He's restoring to him the land of Saul so that he would always have food to eat. And he's saying, I'm bringing you to my table. You'll eat at my table now. He says, I'll restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And what does Mephibosheth say to him? What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Mephibosheth is saying, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. I offer nothing really to the kingdom. I'm crippled. I'm the grandson of the former king. At most... I'm a problem for your kingdom because I represent what was before. But David says, I am honoring my promise to show you kindness. I'm honoring a promise I made to your dad. And more than just not killing you, more than just saying you can stay in Lodabar and I'm not going to bother you for the rest of your life, he's saying, no, I'm restoring land to you. I'm putting servants in charge of this land so it will be taken care of. It will be uh, farmed. There will be produce. There will be a profit. There will be product for you. But you won't even have to worry about that because I'm bringing you to sit at my table like you're one of my sons. I'm allowing you to sit and eat with me for the rest of your life. You can come back to Jerusalem again. You can eat at the king's table again. 
Talk about moving from fear to joy. What a blessing it is. No longer will Mephibosheth have to hide and live in fear that David may find him. No, David knows exactly where he is and he's blessing him. He has honored his promise to Jonathan and he is taking care of the son of his friend. And man, when I think about biblical stories of joy, I can't help but think about Mephibosheth, an enemy to the king, crippled and unable to do anything about it, living in fear of potential judgment from this new king, living in fear that his life is on the line. And then in one act by David, he's ushered into a new life. David remembers his promise and fulfills it. And Mephibosheth is granted a seat at the table. Not just the kid's table, not a leaning card table, but the king's table. And maybe I can relate to Mephibosheth because just like him, I was at odds with God. My sin had made me an enemy to God. My sin had created a debt that was owed to God. It created a divide between me and God, your sin creates a divide between you and God. And just like Mephibosheth, there is nothing I can do about it on my own. Spiritually, I was crippled. None of my works could do anything about my spiritual position. I had no chance in a fight or an argument with God about my sin. I was spiritually crippled, but God, God sends his son to earth to pay my debt, to die in my place, to show unconditional love to me, even while I deserve nothing but death. And just like Mephibosheth, I'm, giving a, I'm given a seat at the table. When you follow Jesus Christ as your savior, when you make him Lord of your life, you're made co-heir with Christ. You're brought to the table just like God's son. But listen, it's not because I deserve it. Mephibosheth wasn't given a seat at the table because he deserved it. He was given a seat at the table because the king said so. And I and you, if you know Christ as Savior, are given a seat, are made co-heirs of Christ, not because I deserve it and some kind of work that I've done, but because the king of kings says so. And so this Advent season, as we look forward and as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, if you want to know true joy, it all starts with Jesus. It starts with a relationship with Jesus. It starts with admitting you're a sinner and that you can do nothing to earn your salvation. There's no good works. There's no amount of church attendance. There's no amount of tithing or, or service you can do in your community that will earn your salvation. It is only through belief and trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior that he came to earth and died in your place, died for your sins. That's the only hope we have in this life. We move from enemies fearful of a judgment to seated at the table when we know Christ as Savior. And so if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, why not kick off this Advent season, this celebration of the birth of Jesus, by making that decision today. And as we stand and get ready to sing this final song, I'll be down front while we sing. I would love to speak with you about salvation. Or maybe you just need to pray. The altar up here is open. There's your pew is open if you just need to pray or if you need to talk about church membership or baptism or any of those next steps, I would love to talk with you. But for those of us that know Christ as Savior, we can celebrate the joy we have that we've been given a seat at the table with Jesus.